Ja. Doch. Okay. Funktioniert. So, let's start. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for coming online this time because uh, Lindy Lechner is in Athens and couldn't make it to Vienna in such a short time. Anyway, it's a honor and a real pleasure to introduce Lindy Lechner. He's maybe one of my oldest friends, not in terms of age, of course, but in terms of duration of acquaintance. And we studied together in Vienna general linguistics. He made his MA thesis there and then went to Amherst where he accomplished his PhD, had various postdoc positions in Germany, Greece, and Cyprus. And finally, he is professor now at the National and Capodistrian University of Athens. And it was quite spontaneous that I invited him to give a talk in our OFI lecture series. And I suspected that he might propose something along the lines uh, of a talk we had with Peter Holman on the semantics of comparatives, but to my surprise, he suggested a much more general and for me really interesting theme or topic. Uh, and that's the, also the title of his talk, Natural Language, Semantics and Music. I won't spoiler anything here. I just say thank you, Vinny, for giving this talk to us. We had to postpone it. I'm really glad to see you now in good shape again. And I'm really looking forward for your presentations. I'm handing over to you now. Thanks. Well, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation and uh, these kind words. Uh, can you hear me? Is, is the acoustics acceptable? I think it's splendid. Perfect, perfect. So don't get the hopes up. I mean, this is not going to be like something which is uh, like, you know, world changing. What I want to do today, and I'm very happy to see a couple of friends here. Hi to uh, Peter and hi to Nina and hi to Valerie. What I'm going to do today, I'm going to actually run through some basic basal stuff about what some people think about natural language semantics and make some suggestions how that might connect to some ideas uh, that have been ventilated recently about uh, the organization of music, of Western tonal music. Um, wait a second. So what I will be talking about is a little bit, that's sort of a primer for people who are linguists, that's going to be boring in, in um, what actually meaning could be. And uh, I will not be touching upon here various issues that have been addressed recently in the literature concerning the uh, well Western tonal music. For instance, I will not be talking about gestural meanings or, or some kind of like relations between spatial uh, semantics and uh, music, as has been done, for instance, work by Philip Schlenker, Migotti, and other people. Um, so it's going to be sort of like a a couple of steps in, in a particular direction. And it's going to be more or less like an attempt to sort of get a, some discussion going on the one hand, and most importantly for me to actually get some feedback and some ideas of, you know, whether certain things make sense or not. Okay. Um, obviously, linguistics and musicology differ in a great extent in various dimensions, across various dimensions. And, um, but there are some overlaps between the two systems. So both of them can be seen as algebras and uh, has been some explorations into these ideas, at least going back to, you know, famous work by, by Schenker in the beginning of the 20th century. And a lot of this has been made out of uh, in work by Lairdal and, and Jackendorf and, and recent work by other linguists like Pesetsky and Katz, for instance. Um, but there are various issues around, I think, that do not make too much sense. And those are mostly related to the questions of semantics, as it is understood from a linguistic point of view. So I want to get basically do, try to get actually make some comments on that part. Mm -hmm. uh, important, like a uh, caveat here, naturally, I'm not a musicologist, so uh, yeah, be lenient on me on, from, from that perspective. So 
the roadmap looks like this. You're going to have a look at, at some congruences, some overlaps, some homologies between language and music. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what denotations, reference, and these concepts mean in linguistics. I do this here for the purpose on the, on the understanding that there might be some musicologists in the audience who might not be familiar with uh, these uh, ideas. And then uh, sort of highlight the complexity of meaning that leads us to the introduction of concepts and then we will see some consequences for music potential consequences and if time permits we can like you know it's those are just like some some addenda think about inferences and quotations two kind of strategies that natural language uses in music or how it can be transposed into the research on music so uh, the standard definition of a language is sort of a discrete compositional commentorial, commentorial system that is responsible for taking meanings into sound. So it's mapping from meanings into sound. And that's something which music is not, evidently. So here we see some, some differences already. At least there's no kind of uh, compositional semantics and famous quotes, for instance, go back to, uh, I think, Lenny Bernstein and various other people. Um, from a formal perspective, language can be or is standardly defined as a set of strings generated by some sort of rule uh, system, a generative grammar. And that's something where actually language and music overlap because we can also think about Western tone music to a certain extent as uh, the set of all well-formed sequences of notes, of chords, of progressions, and so on. Um, and a more sort of a alternative, more precise way of, of putting this would be a language is a feature calculus. It's a set of production rules. And these production rules that do not really care about meaning. So if one approaches uh, the topic of music from that perspective, it has been has become possible, uh, has been, um, been pointed out by people like Romare, it makes sense to, for instance, study the expressive power of music. So where is, for instance, music of a particular ilk located on the Chomsky hierarchy? And uh, uh, I really recommend work by Martin Rohrmeyer, which is extremely revealing on, on, on these kind of like uh, issues. Let's look at the table here that gives a little bit more complete overview of what language and music is or isn't. We've already seen there are like, language is a discrete system. It has this atomic units. Music arguably works the same. It's combinatorial. That's, an, op that's, that's uh, an observation that goes back to the, yeah, Marin Mersenne -Nah already, the mathematician famous for his Mersenne -Nah numbers. So that's a rather old observation. Language is compositional in uh, its meanings and evidently music does not have such a device to its avail. Language is recursive, and so is music to a certain extent. There's still some debate about the recursiveness of music, and at which level, at the like, uh, at, at which level of, of of analysis actually that would apply. Um, language is truth conditional in a in a very direct way, while music is usually thought to be not truth conditional. Recent work by Schlenker uses something closely related to the concept of truth in assessing the well-formedness of certain musical progressions, but it's not the same, it's not the Tarskin way of doing it. Um, what we will mostly be concerned with are the red-lighted items here in this uh, short presentation. Language is a lexicon. That's uh, one of the standard observations. It's a set of four meaning pairs and music, well, it seems it is as if music doesn't have that. Then languages categories that come out of this lexicon. And again, the question arises, is something similar? Can something similar be found in music? And I think this has non-trivial consequences for the way we um, address music. Ambiguity is a hallmark property. It's a mismatch of the form meaning correspondence. And that is found in language as it is in music. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about the music part here in detail. Um, 
there might be other mismatches between form and meaning, meaning without form, so-called case of ellipsis, and form without meaning, in this case of expletives, elements that are there just for syntactic formal reasons in language, but do not contribute anything to the meaning, like the S in S regnet, or it is raining. And here it's debatable whether such items um, are actually, uh, can be found in, in music. Um, language is furthermore independent of the modality in which it is expressed. So there is an acoustic realm, there's also a visual realm, there's also a tactile realm and so on. And uh, one of the many properties that have been taken to be constitutive of language is the so-called duality of patterning. We're gonna be talking about that in a second. That's also unclear whether we find something similar in music. So that's a, a rather like a you know, naive way of, of approaching any topic. So basically listing, listing properties of two systems and, and comparing them, we'll see that there's a way of like making this more structured. Let's start with the modality. We've already seen that, that in uh, language, you have different ways of uh, expressing the results of the mind internal combinatorial system. It's not so clear whether this is actually possible in music. What might be of interest here is that uh, the non-sensory part of language is uh, comes usually out very clearly in so-called internal language or monologues. So like basically language, when, when you talk to yourself in a silent way, and something similar, for instance, might be there in, in music. What about duality of, of patterning? That's uh, a phenomenon that goes back to um, the work by, by Hockett. And it's sort of a, a phenomenon that actually language has two different levels. At one level, you have like meaningless items that are combined, sounds. And then at the next level, once you combine these sounds into morphemes or larger units, all of a sudden something emerges, meaning. So basically there is some duality to the function of, of, of sounds at a certain level, they all of a sudden become meaningful. That's something which is not found in other combinatorial systems. So for instance, in mathematics, if you have uh, symbols and uh, you define them as they're usually defined, like ciphers, operators, and brackets, uh, irrespective at which level you look at, there's no additional meaning that would emerge at a higher level. Um, going on with these preparatory notes to make sense of what we're going to be saying uh, a little bit later, let me uh, just give you a couple of examples of the phenomenon of ambiguity. Again, this is like for linguists, of course, uh, trivial fare. Um, I included it here for the purposes for the for the um, if, if if there are any any musicologists on board. So we do know that uh, sentences like one, for instance, "Show me the bat" has two meanings, or two. Mary spotted the thief with the binoculars. There can be the thief or Mary who is uh, in possession of the instrument, and the various cases of of uh, mismatches between form and meaning indicating that the mapping from meaning, from, from, from the form to meaning, is not a function. And similar mismatches are, we have already seen that in the intro part, are also tested in, in other directions. So there's uh, sometimes unexpressed parts that actually are interpreted in ellipses, or there are expressed parts that are not interpreted as expertise. Good. Those, those are the preparatory remarks that um, sort of will be helpful to follow what we're going to be doing from now on. Um, in linguistics, usually we use a sort of denotation, the term denotation to um, talk about the semantic value of an expression. And we use these brackets, these Oxford brackets, to extract the semantic value. Now, the uh, goal of semantics is, that's the standard textbook definition, is to describe the competence of speakers to be able to assign meanings, to map meanings of any type, if they're well formed, to uh, the expressions, uh, to, to, well, to, to the notations in a, in a certain meaning domain. So, for instance, the sentence one is my most likely a sentence that nobody has ever heard before, 
was seen before. Hence, Ignaz Franz Bieber's son was the supervisor of Wolfgang Amade Mozart's father. But we do all understand what it means. We also know what its truth conditions are. The sentence is true, just in case the individual that this name, Heinz Ignaz Franz Bieber, denotes is in a particular relation to uh, Mozart or Mozart's father. It happens to be true, that sentence, by the way. And um, the way that actually leads up to solving the competence puzzle is usually subdivided into various steps. So like in chemistry, one can ask what are the, what are the smallest and what are the largest units and what are the ways that these units are combined. So usually in linguistics, we start with sentence denotations because those are the bearers of uh, truth conditions. And then from there, we basically subtract known parts to get a glimpse at the meaning of the smallest, of the atoms of meaning. And then we can ask about the combinatorial principles that uh, lead to the composition of complex meanings out of simple meanings. So let us start here, and I will be concerned only with the smallest units in this presentation. Let us start with the meanings that specific specific um, items are assigned. Um, so the classical view is that we have uh, nominal expressions that are referential to a certain extent, like the expressions Joe Biden, the president of the USA, and so on. The referent can be abstract to a certain extent. Um, and the referent doesn't even have to exist in our evaluation world. So according to my view, I have finally realized that Santa Claus doesn't exist and so on and so on. <clears throat> um, Reference is not the only meaning, of course, that there is, because there are quite a number of, that also, that those are the most interesting ones, expressions that are non-referential, that lack reference. For instance, um, quantificational phrases like uh, every book, most books, or uh, yeah, predicates. Now, the standard way of modeling um, reference or the sign has been to follow purse or saucer in sort of seeing the form mini correspondence as being given as an arbitrary relation. Um, again, like you know, for the non-linguists uh, remark here, arbitrary here does not mean random. Uh, so random would uh, be a relation, for instance, like the one on the top of slide 13 here, where the expression tree is assigned different kind of meanings depending upon context, for instance. That's, that's not the case now usually. Now, let's see, if reference would be everything, then um, I think it would be easier so to sort of identify possible correlations between music and language, but there's much more to it, which actually makes it more intriguing to look at music from the perspective of language. Let's start with a common misconception, one that is uh, discussed widely in the philosophical literature and and it's the point that in some guys also like non semanticists like chomp has made that um the internal the men mental representations they do not that we form when we use language they do not really directly point to reality so um the meanings are not functions that take linguistics forms to something in the world that is the classical kind of idea that is usually expressed in terms of triangles like these ones. And a number of problems that are obvious here are the, of the following type. For instance, there are expressions without reference. So what happens if something doesn't exist in the world? Um, more interesting problem is uh, the, a variety of the ambiguity problem. So even if we focus on the most simple cases of arguably referential express expressions, names, it is possible to show that the relation between a name and its meaning is not functional. So it doesn't really, a name doesn't really refer counter to what we said before. It's something much more complex 
that what a name is actually introducing in the semantics. Let's look at a classic example that are examples that uh, are usually come under the under the heading of double vision. If you have the two sentences, the bare sentences, John will win the election or whatever, no? and John will not win, those are contradictions. But interestingly enough, if you embed those sentences under um, predicates like think, believe, whatever, propositional attitude predicates, uh, the contradiction disappears. Mary thinks that Bill will win, and Mary thinks that Bill will not win. Those are two sentences which can be true in one and the same situation. Let's look at an example. Let's look at a specific scenario. <clears throat> Those are cases which more or less are modifications of uh, Quine's work. Um, so, for instance, Mary is a professional acquaintance with Bill, and uh, he's a candidate for the elections. And um, before the election, Mary joins a group of friends, the bar, and they watch an interview with Bill on TV. So, while in real life, Mary has a relation with Bill and she's like really convinced that that guy will nail it. While Mary's at the bar, she unfortunately gets drunk and mistakes Bill for somebody else or actually doesn't recognize him. And she thinks that actually that guy is not really doing too well. So she uh, entertains the thought that Bill will not win. So this scenario in which Mary has uh, a relation to another individual in the world, Bill, and the two different acquaintances or acquaintance relations, mm -hmm. this kind of scenario uh, allows us to utter both sentences three and four as being, and, and both of them can be uh, simultaneously be interpreted as true. So the standard way of, of modeling this is to use uh, something additional, to introduce something additional into the meaning of the propositions are approximately across the following lines. So um, on the one interpretation of the sentence, Mary thinks that Bill will win, it means approximately something like the first line here. There's something like a concept or a guise or some, something else, you know, an acquaintance relation of Bill to Mary, uh, such that Mary thinks that Bill will win under that concept or given that concept. And on the second, sentence, Mary thinks that Bill will not win, uh, the interpretation would be something like there is a concept, possibly a different one, of Bill for Mary, such that Mary thinks that Bill will not win under that concept. Thus, like the, the name Bill itself is ambiguous to a certain degree. It, uh, to get taken together with the concept that uh, takes Bill as an argument, it is uh, uh, sort of denoting two different two different objects. So the, um, the more fine-grained part would, uh, sorry, the more fine-grained part would look like this here. Um, so Bill would be uh, related to a concept that we call a married life, and there would be an individual, the person, that Mary is acquainted with in reality. And there would be a second, version of Bill, therefore ambiguity, that we call here Mary on TV, uh, which uh, yields the individual that Mary is acquainted with by Mary seeing that individual on TV. And that makes it possible to uh, render both sentences three and four as true without creating a contradiction. So, um, what we have seen so far is something very simple in, in semantic terms. Um, Bill is not really just a name that denotes or refers to an individual or stands in for an individual. It's something more complex. It denotes a function. It denotes a function from individuals or possibly individuals to possibly individuals. And that actually will be something which might be of interest um, later on. Um, concepts on this on this view are rather complex functions, and if you look at the details, there have been sort of various proposals which make them look uh, rather intriguing. And um, 
the semantic competency issue that always is at the background of linguists consists in the ability to acquire and compute and model uh, to, to, to modify such such functions. Now, what are the consequences for musical semantics? I think some, something very simple. Um, that this very simple observation is that when we look for the meaning of items or objects or atoms in, in music, it's not necessarily the case that we should look for abstract individuals or something in the domain of individuals that actually stand in for, for instance, a single note or a chord or something like that. But we should be also give us the avail of ourselves of the opportunity to actually look for something more complex, to look for functions. So basically, um, this, this widens our realm of search when we're looking for meaning in, in musical semantics. And I think this is something which is uh, potentially of, of um, benefit. Um, I'm not going to be talking too much about yeah, theory of mind here. I just want to mention it that from a psychological perspective, it's very interesting to observe that there might be connections, tight connections between the language ability on the one hand and the ability to create um, to create representations of other people's internal representations sort of like copy their representations into your head. That is what theory of mind is about. And um, there might be sort of a relation here between the ability of using Tom and uh, the ability of, of using language. And something similar might be at work in, in music. I haven't really figured out exactly what actually might be directions to go there, but to the best of my knowledge, there is not that much on theory of mind and, and music, but it definitely plays a substantial role if you think about, for instance, you know, expectations or broken expectations and various other kind of standard concepts and strategies that are used in music. Good. Um, now let us go and let us go on and try to make the what we've seen so far a little bit more uh, precise. And I'm gonna talk about briefly about two further um, notions here, extension intention, and intentions will be necessary because we will be talking about concepts. And concept might be something that uh, are useful in the, when, when applied to music. So we have seen that a name, a simple name can be ambiguous like Bill, but even, yeah, this, this, is, this is sort of a, a standard, standard observation, but uh, um, the duality of meaning or the, the fact that meaning comes in different dimensions is a more widespread phenomenon. For instance, um, a normal expression like president of the USA has on the one hand a sort of a constant meaning, the intention, which we can call the concept, but it also can have a particular interpretation on a on, on a particular kind of index on a particular in a particular context. Okay. Man of the moon, same thing, but the same applies to predicates. So for instance, today uh, in Athens, the individuals that actually satisfy the predicate awake, they include at least me. I think so. And in Vienna, they might include uh, Friedrich or nobody, depending on the, you know, the state and the quality of this talk here, and so on. So we have two different uh, dimensions of meaning is a more general way of uh, modeling the contribution of, of meaning. And intentions in particular are what we usually think as, let me go back here, are usually what we think of as the linguistic manifestation of concepts. Now, what are concepts more generally? Generally, uh, it's pretty hard to, to find a good, a good kind of theory of, of, of uh, concepts, as uh, many of you might, might know. There's, there's a very old and, and uh, long literature on, on, on this topic. So for instance, concepts shouldn't be definitions. It's very hard to define sort of like, you know, necessary and sufficient conditions, for instance, for a concept table. I mean, that's a table, but you know, these thing is here are also tables, but 
it's hard to find extensionally invariant properties of these objects. And even closely related concepts sometimes have quite distinct requirements on them. So healthy and sick, for instance, they, they look very similar, but in, in essence, they actually, if you look at what these concepts are, they require different you know, modes of quantification in them. So it's very hard to actually give a definition, definitional interpretation of concepts. What has been attempted is to see concept as prototypes, manifestations of a particular type that is very typical of something. And also here we have like famous count examples, famous pet fish example, for instance. A pet fish is neither typical pet, it would be dogs and cats, nor a typical fish. That would be whatever, no sharks and what you have there. And another problem, maybe like more, more substantially, is it's the quantification, uh, how, how to quantify the similarity, how to actually find a metric that tells you what is more prototypical than something else is a very iffy problem. So clearly, uh, clearly things can uh, be compared across different dimensions. An elephant can be similar to a car regarding weight, but also like, you know, similar to a, a flea regarding color. So there are different dimensions in these concepts that are activated. Now, let's look at the classical example. We have like three uh, objects, a hummingbird, a chicken, and a drone, and we have three different dimensions. The ability to fly, the uh, property of emitting a humming sound and being small, being like, you know, in weight. And if we sort of apply any kind of like uh, plausible metric here, what we see is that a hummingbird uncannily comes out as, comes out as being uncannily similar to a drone instead of a chicken. And that's of course only one example, but there's a lot of kind of like um, literature about that. It's very difficult to actually find a metric that could be used in a prototype theory of concepts. Still a third idea is um, uh, averages. Take concepts as averages. And uh, yeah, this is also doomed in some sense. I'm not gonna go through the, the details here. The idea is um, if you do statistical averages to say whether something is a typical bird or a typical C, you know, on, a, on a scale, that would be like something which uh, does not create uh, expect uh, create actually results that actually uh, dovetail with uh, experimental uh, results. Good. So whatever we we know, I'm also going to skip this part here. Uh, we know that actually um, concepts are required and they are compositional in some sense. And um, we don't know whether they are learned, whether they are like you know, innate, all these things are um, up to grasp for the moment. But we do know that there are concepts and those are like necessary, whatever we call them, those are necessary um, items in our toolkit. And the classically operative definition of a concept is, it's a mental representation that categorizes things. It's a sorting mechanism. It sorts things into different categories. So all the preamble I had so far is actually, the reason why I have that is like to come up with um, that kind of like uh, idea or with this, this kind of like, you know, um, result here. Um, what we have seen so far is um, concepts categorize stuff. And um, they are non-trivial functions. So they are, as we said before, something which is suitable for the meanings we might be looking for in, in music. Recall that we were saying uh, meanings in language are complex, they're functions. And that sort of like loosened our restriction to just look for simple things, simple denotations when we look for the meaning of uh, atoms, the atoms of music, for instance. Um, and 
Another kind of consequence that we'll be visiting in a, in a second is um, when we use concepts that allows us to use symbolic rules, um, and that's going to be the the next the next step here. Okay, now let's go a little bit more in in detail in what rules are. They're simply yeah, we have a lexicon that's a list of atomic signs, and the lexicon is working on uh, yeah the, the rules are working on the lexicon, and these rules are uh, designed to grab only certain subparts, proper subparts, so certain categories out of that lexicon. So for instance, uh, sentences are combinations of whatever, no noun phrases and verb phrases, but uh, sentences never combine adjectival phrases and verb phrases. So in some sense, the, the category plays a role here, uh, in that sense, plays a role here in that um, the rules are uh, sensitive towards their uh, towards their presence. A second related concept is the concept of endocentricity. So what endocentricity means is that certain kind of properties of items at the lower level are projected up to a higher level. More precisely, in a for instance syntactic tree, the category information, the noun phrase, has to show up somewhere lower in the noun phrase or vice versa, the, the head, the lowest part of the, of the noun phrase, the noun projects up or passes on its nouniness to a higher level. And that is sort of a, a, a guiding principle, a sort of a dogma, an axiom of, of, uh, of language that complex expressions to a certain extent obey endocentricity. So from this, we get two observations. If you have rules in a system, then we have categories. That's sort of the modus tollens of if there are no categories, there are no rules. And the second observation is, um, if you have endocentricity in the system, then we have categories. So whenever we find a system that's rule-based, we want to have categories. Whenever we find a system that's endocentric, we want to have categories. Now, that's the that's sort of like no, that not a part that actually is concerned with what the title was uh, somewhat like an you know, boldly promising. That's what what yeah the musical kind of like part starts here. Um, there's a famous uh, uh, hypothesis going back to Katz and Besetsky, and the hypothesis holds that because natural language doesn't have um, signs, so Syrian signs that uh, uh, display the duality of, of natural language signs that don't have any meaning part. Uh, for that reason, music has no lexicon. If that is correct now, with what we have said before, we uh, end up with a couple of consequences. The first one is uh, if the categories are indeed lexically given, there are some people who disagree on that, but I think that's like, you know, more or less the standard view. If categories come from the lexicon and there is no lexicon, then there should be no categories in music. Now recall that uh, if there are rules, then we need categories. And if you know, something is endocentric, we need categories that has consequences for how we look at music. Um, that's the second, uh, uh, yeah, I, I make this explicit in a second cal, cal, um, corollary here. So um, the consequence more explicitly would be if the non, no musical lexical hypothesis is correct, would be that um, since music doesn't have a lexicon, music doesn't have categories. And since music doesn't have categories, there are no endocentric structures and there's, there are no rules in music. And that's something which I think most musicologists would tend to disagree with. Um, so there's some, some tension here between a prominent view of what differentiates 
language and music on the one hand and uh other kind of like axioms and, and, and statements in the system that lead us to certain kind of conclusions. There are of course a number of objections. Maybe categories do not come from the lexicon. Maybe they are like you know, semantically grounded, but you know, even in language that's very hard to argue for. So we have like nouns that denote different things, like we have verbs that denote actions and uh, states and whatever. So like it's very unlikely that uh, a semantic grounding for instance, of categories would help us here, specifically also because if we maybe talk about music, because we don't know what the meanings in music are. Okay. So um, what this leads us to conclude is that um, music should have a lexicon. There's a musical lexicon, but it's just not made up of the simple kind of Saussurean science that we are used to when we open a simple one-on-one -on -one linguistic textbook. Um, and the second consequence is like an integrating some insights from the very beginning of this presentation, the meaning or the, 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 the meaning might be more complex. Con more, more, more precisely what, what one might uh, um, see is that the lexicon music more, resembles lexicon under the conception of a category grammar, which collapses, for instance, syntactic and semantic rules on the one hand, and has uh, usually a, a richer structure than, than like, you know, monostratal theories in, in semantics or in syntax. So what do I mean by category grammar? Category grammar is a version of a generative grammar that has many benefits and, and probably some like disadvantages as any kind of like a human endeavor. Um, the basic idea is that the categories in, in category grammar, they are not like just subscripts, like noun or be a adjective or whatever and something. They're not just like a, um, sorting keys for lexical items, but they are actually rich in structure. For category grammar, the, the categories are giving information about the distributional properties of something. If something is a verb, like sleep, then it's something that needs to combine with a noun phrase. If something is a, a noun, then it, you know, behaves differently and so on. And one idea might be to consider the musical lexicon as being made up of categorical kind of entries. So the, um, there's, there's precedence for that in work by, by Steedman and, and Ganroth Wilding. So the idea would be that um, certain chord progressions, cadences, for instance, can be uh, interpreted as giving us the distributional invariance of certain kind of relations or of certain kind of items in certain contexts. So for instance, if you have the uh, subdominant and you have the dominant with the tonica, then the subdominant is sort of like demanding as its neighbor, something that actually turns the dominant into the tonica. So that's sort of a classical kind of like categorical kind of uh, interpretation of what the meaning would be on this conception of, for instance, the um, subdominant here. So what we see is then that the absence of the notations for the atoms in music, that doesn't mean that music doesn't have a lexicon. So um, Pesetsky and Katz are incorrect in that kind of respect. Rather, the lexicon in music is something which cares about uh, distributional properties. And that's actually something which is uh, not totally alien to natural language semantics from different perspectives either. There are variants of semantics where the meaning of an item is uh, more or less seen as something closely related to the distributional properties of that item. Um, so on that conjecture that uh, we see in this, in this uh, 
final kind of um, slides, the meanings of the musical primitives are simply context change potential, something like that. There are functions that actually allow you, they, they, they give you sort of like what it what is a well-formed uh, continuation. And um, on this view here, these functions are not just like syntactic primitives, but they might be seen as something closely related to what is used in dynamic semantics, for instance. So th there, there would be sort of a meaning to these interpretations. Okay, so that's basically what I wanted to, to say. So the idea would be that, um, how are we time-wise? No, just go on. Okay, so this is basically what I wanted to say. There's sort of this idea that um, ideas that are sort of make music and language look too distinct, robbing music of a lexicon, I think that's not a good way to go. Better actually to, yeah, generalize the ideas by, by statement. Actually, I, I came up with this idea about category stuff first. That's always I can claim now. And then, of course, I read that Stephen had already thought about something very similar. Yeah, it's, it's usually. But um, I, th I think something like that might be a very interesting kind of uh, sort of continuation. As a sort of an afterthought, sort of, as two afterthoughts, let's have a look at two, uh, two notions that are fundamental in, in semantics and which also seem to show up in music. And I don't think that the first one actually has been dealt with uh, extensively recently by work by Schlenker, but uh, I think there's uh, there's virtually nothing on, on on quotations, and that's some 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 other kind of parts or like you know venues one might pursue in trying to see how linguistic methods and the linguistic toolkit can be applied to the study of music. Okay, we do know that the number of different inferences in natural language. So for instance, this logical entailment, like in one. So, and there are also presuppositions, like in two, Mary began playing the flute, presupposes that she has not played the flute before a certain time. The implicatures, if I say somebody has three children, that means that person has not more than three children. And the standard way of, of uh, distinguishing between them among others is to look whether these uh, these inferences can be taken away, can be canceled. So for instance, you cannot cancel a logical entailment. Sally read all books and Sally did not read all books. Those two sentences are contradictions. But you can, for instance, cancel uh, implicature. John has three children. For that reason, he is allowed to apply for a tax reduction. Then somebody says, ah, well, you know, John has even four children. He doesn't have three children. But that doesn't mean that actually these three, these two statements in three and four would be contradictory. Um, presuppositions can famously not be canceled in most cases. And that might be something, yeah, oops. That might be something which might be worth looking into when considering the properties of uh, progressions and cadences and uh, resolutions in music. So um, simple basic question is, oh, do we deal with entailments, implicatures, presuppositions, cause cause presuppositions or what? Um, what should be used? The various ways of, of dealing with, uh, with uh, for instance, entailments, it can be like you know seen as a formal property, or it can be seen as a property of meaning. And uh, I think one interesting way to start here would be to uh, have a look at the, what uh, Martin Roma calls preparations, but that seems to be like an, an implicated presupposition. So preparations are basically uh, um, yeah triggers of some sense that uh, introduce a certain kind of like, you know, condition on the progression of a tonal contour, for instance. Um, now, if you look at this kind of simple set of, of uh, like, you know, items here, different types of, of inferences, one additional question that would come up here is, uh, yeah, 
cancelability. Is it possible to cancel, for instance, musical inferences of any type? And I guess like uh, musicologists will find a lot of, of abundance of, of examples where that actually is the case. So if broken expectations and all the kind of the things might come in here. And expectations, of course, we, I mentioned this very briefly before, are sort of uh, fall under the realm of a fear of mind. So uh, it might be interesting to see how, how, how far you can go in like uh, sort of disappointing, this sort of like, you know, uh, taking away people's ex expectation, canceling people's expectations, sort of. And it's quite, quite difficult, I think, in music, because on the one hand, um, yeah, even, even if you restrict yourself to Western tonal music, because there's a lot of stuff that only becomes visible once you study the, the score. If you go, for instance, into Goldberg variations, or whatever, that's not like really an easy piece that unfolds its properties just from listening, you need to actually look at the score and or whatever. Okay. Now, the last item here I have here is quotations. Um, well, quotations are simply like, you know, sort of like combinations of meta and object language. And there are interesting kind of like uh, properties of some quotations, like they can be mixed. Something can be a quote and not a quote at the same time. Ellis said that life is difficult to understand, has sort of like the properties given on the, the line below. Uh, so this string under the square quotes is basically used both as a quote and in its object language, uh, uh, as, it, uh, as an object language expression. Now that usually, yeah, that's just some form, some, some, some notational stuff here. Um, now the question here is, of course, citation is something that we find in abundance in, in music, in, in various shapes, in various guises. Uh, the question is, is there, for instance, also something that comes close to mixed or quasi quotation in music? And that in turn has like uh, repercussions upon the way the system is modeled that describes the property of music, because uh, something, if, if, if you look into the the outcome of studies of quotation, it tells you that the simple sort of uh, serene system, some glimpses of which I've given you of, of semantics, that simple system is not far by, not, not, not strong enough to actually explain what language is really doing. Sort of quotation actually throws in a couple of like, you know, additional kind of confounds that uh, any theory of language needs to accommodate. And the same goes for music. So one possible example for, for some kind of like a quasi or mixed quotation is the following that I came up with. So uh, in Shostakovich's number five symphony, there is a, yeah, there's sort of a, in the final movement, there's sort of a, a, a big debate about that kind of like intention. So does this really like, you know, express Stalin's uh, desires as a triumphant kind of celebration of the Soviet, or was it like, you know, um, something different in the sense that actually Shostakovich was qu just quoting Stalin's uh, thoughts or whatever. So there's a lot, lot of like things could be said about that. It's just, again, as, let, let, let me stress this, those are just like, you know, uh, random ideas here, r random like, you know, observations here. Okay. Once you start with uh, quotation, I think quotation is, is a good starting point in, in, in investigating music because it's rather well understood or well studied from, from the point of, of, of semantics. One could like go into that direction and proceed into the areas of irony, metaphor, and other kind of like, you know, uh, uh, strategies, which definitely also seem to play a role in, in music. And there's also some work on that in, in linguistics, but I'm not aware of any, any uh, studies that would look at music from, that, from, from the linguistic perspective and, and uh, concentrating on these kind of phenomena. Okay, so the basic idea is that uh, I wanted to like, you know, make a very small point today. Um, well, I've been pointing out that meaning is not had nothing to do with reference and that we need concepts. Concepts are something that help us 
probably also in the way that we um, conceive of other individuals' mental representations. And concepts can be given sort of a, a by the fly definition and operational definition. Concepts create categories, the categorized stuff, the sorting mechanisms. And um, we have seen that from that uh, with, with, with this in hand, we um, end up at the conclusion that since rules require categories, music needs to have concepts and concepts are part of the lexicon. So music needs to have a lexicon. That was a little bit quick now, but I think you recall what the, what the steps were there. So um, music does have a lexicon, that's the idea that's necessary in order to actually allow music to have a rule system. And then the question is, what is that lexicon? What's the meaning part of that, of these signs, if there's any? And one suggestion, suggestion would be to uh, make those meanings look like the, uh, yeah, the distributional kind of properties of items, the progressions, sort of like the context change potential in some sense. So um, yeah, that's that's what what I uh, wanted to yeah share with you today. Thank you very much, and um, thanks for being patient. <laughs>